Dale, and we're going to talk about some recruitment practices and have a conversation about that. And, and as Eric started stated before, excuse me, uh, we will be utilizing the raise hand function uh, on the panel on the right hand side of your screen. So when you do have questions or would like to make comments, please do so and I'll unmute you so you can interact with Tina through that means. Again, look forward to future advertisements for the mid-level virtual roundtables coming each month throughout this year. And with that, I will bring Tina over to start the session. Good afternoon. You may have noticed when Brian was talking that it said that, that I was talking as well. We're in the same office. We figured that would be, um, that would be easier on everyone. So in, if you hear his voice, it's really not me and vice versa. So um, please know that. But thank you so much for signing up for this webinar to talk about some recruitment because it definitely is that time of year for all of us. Um, it's critical as um, as Brian said too, that we use the raise the hand function. This is a roundtable, so it it should be just as a roundtable is when you're attending a conference. It's it's all about each of us sharing our experiences and me really guiding through that process. We have some really remarkable people who have who are also listening, who I know have valuable experience to share. So, looking forward to sharing great ideas, some best practices, etc. So, you should be able to see there's an agenda for our conversation today that we'll guide through with the questions already on there. So um, for those of you that like to sneak ahead, you can, you can peek a little bit at the topics that we're going to be talking about. But we'll just go ahead and get started so we can make the most of our time here together. Since you're the welcome and introduction, we've just had that and we reviewed the process again. And again, when you raise your hand, we'll, we'll call on you to answer the questions and everyone should be able to hear it. Brian will help you through any technical issues in Brian and Eric as well, any technical issues that we might have. So without any further ado, recruitment. Clearly it is it is that time of the year for, for all of us in housing and residence life. And well what that means is bringing on our, our new staff. And for mid-level folks, it really there's a whole other level of organizing that goes to through this process. And um, the exchanges that I have listed, so this weekend already is is the Southeast Placement Exchange, and then next week is OPE, uh, TPE is March 7th through the 11th, ACPA um, Career Central is March 24th through the 28th, and several of us are in this situation potentially where we're, we're on campus recruiting. We may not be attending any of the exchanges. Um, if we could get an idea of through the chat function, and Brian can share the information to get an idea of those of you attending, listening right now, what um, exchanges you may possibly be attending, that would be fantastic to kind of help us understand where everybody's going. So as you're, if you could type that into your chat box, that would be fantastic. So USI is going to OPE. Wayne State is also going to OPE. Marquette is going to OPE and TPE. Miami is going to ACPA and TPE. And Wright State was OPE. And that seems to be everybody we have with us right now. So the group of us going to a variety of places for sure. So that's exciting to see. Um, well, moving on, many of you have probably started this process. But if you haven't, it's good to revisit it and to let each other hear how we um, create our recruitment messages. So the first question that I really want to throw out there are, what are those key components um, that should be included in your recruitment message. And with that, you'll need to raise your hand and we'll call on you to answer those questions. So be thinking about what are those things that you use to come up with your recruitment message. First, we'll go to Lori Berry.
Lauren, we seem to be having some technical difficulties with you, so we're going to go to Vika first. Vika? So, um, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, great. Um, so one of the things that we do is our, I meet with our previous recruited classes, um, mm -hmm. go over what their experience was, and then uh, make appropriate adjustments to our recruitment based upon previous year's feedback. Mm -hmm. I also here use their uh, Joe Salongo and I can't remember the other person um, at the University of Michigan did a presentation at Lacuho um, mm -hmm. where they um, shared the results of their nationwide survey for people who recruited last year. Mm -hmm. It's our review information and then um, had some communication with our Office of Equity, Equal Op and Op Opportunity and our HR office to determine whether or not uh, we can make some of, some of the suggested changes to our process. So um, awesome. I also make sure that our um, job description is has been vetted both internally mm -hmm. um, within office as well as Division of Student Affairs and then externally with our Human Resources Office and our Office of Equity and Equal Opportunity so that when I actually want to proceed with the posting, I don't get caught up later um, by those two offices. Yeah, Vicki, so that's, that's what we do. Awesome. That's some really great feedback for everybody to hear too, especially those people. I love how you're getting feedback from previous years of, of what that experience was like, but also Oftentimes, too, we need to make sure, not often, but always, we should be making sure to vet those processes through HR, as you had mentioned, um, to make sure the postings are accurate. And it sometimes can be tricky when, they're, when you're posting, um, your requirements are different sometimes, and how we post it at exchanges sometimes may be limited comparatively, but there's two have to coincide, so great, great feedback. Thanks. I'm going to try it. Lori Bear, we're going to try you again. Okay. I, I, I had some audio issues. I apologize for, um, for that. Um, just building kind of off of what um, Vic had said, at USI we work hand in hand with our, our HR department, but one of the other things that we know about our organization is that we're values based. And so we mm -hmm. make sure that we get our, our core values out there and our mission and our vision um, statement when we're, when we're advertising um, as much as possible and put that out front. Um, so that would that was what I wanted to add. No, that's great, Lori. Well, I think you two really hit that on the head. You covered a variety of of areas with that. Um, so thank you for sharing that for sure. The mission and vision part is is critical. We all have mission and vision to our department, so we need to make sure that we go back and and are looking at that to make sure that the message that we're sending out for recruitment coincides with who we are as an organization and an institution for sure. Well, we started to touch on this a little bit, but moving into the next question, who needs to be involved in that conversation? So uh, Vic and Lori mentioned the HR piece, mentioned talking to former staff, um, looking at your mission and vision. What are some, who else should be involved in those conversations of creating your message? I know for me, the obvious is always is my supervisor, um, and maybe sometimes it's my supervisor, supervisor, depending on on the process. But making sure that they fully understand where we're going, what the message is that we're sending out, because wherever we leave the institution, yours are representing the institution. So whether your supervisor is attending or not any of these events, you need to make sure that they're on the same page with what we're doing. We're gonna. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, we have uh, a lot of student contact with our candidates, and so I, I, we, in January, I'm um, sort of after the initial conversation about recruitment, uh, before we, but before we start really delving into the season, um, there's a presentation that we do uh, to our student staff during training that talks about um, effect, uh, talks about uh, appropriate questions, gives them a general overview of our process, talks about the story we tell about Miami, so um, that we're, you know, located in Oxford and that we have a predominantly white um, population and, and just some things that students may not notice or know that are unique to us, especially because at Miami um, our first-year advisors do academic advising and for them that's very normal, um, but yeah. they might not realize that a, a candidate coming from another school may not understand that. And so we try to articulate some of those things that make us uniquely us um, so mm -hmm. that when students are communicating with um, other pers with, with people with prospective um, employees that they have, they're giving a, a full story. 
Yeah, that's really great advice to really find those things that are unique to your campus that your staff and students may think is the norm and pointing out those things that are different so they can really know how to talk about it and, and, care, and really highlight those uniquenesses because that will really make you stand apart from others. And Daniel, you're unmuted now if you want to add in. Maybe. I mean, we know you are here. So you may be having a few technical difficulties. If you want to type it in right now, um, we can send it out to the group that way, too. Any other thoughts on who else should be involved in the conversation? Then we'll, we'll move down to the next one. What message do you want to send to the candidates? I mean, there's the obvious message that you have an opening, right? And we want that opening to be filled. So there's language that's included in the position description. But really, when you are going through the recruitment process, there, there's messages and, that you want to send to the candidates about you. What are those things that you want candidates to know that you have found to be most helpful? For example, for me, it's really important for people to know about the staff that I have here. Because um, at the end of the day, I really believe recruitment is about making connections with people. So the more ways that I can find it to share highlights of the staff that we have here and what they do beyond their job, it's really critical um, for me to get that information out, for that message of that it is a family type of environment here. Lori, you're up. Uh, one of the other things that, that we like to, to, get, to get out at USI is that we want it to, to be conversational. I want to find out from the candidates, and I know that's a little different than the question you were, you were asking no, what you include in the message, but that it's, that it's a conversation and it's about matching. USI is, a very, is, a, is what we are, and we're a regional institution, and, and we want to make sure that that match is, is going to happen, and so we want it to be very much a, a dialogue. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lori. Um, I think the other thing, too, is, is I want that message to come across. I want them to come away with authentic things that, of what it is to work here. Um, we are somebody, we're an institution where it is more of a traditional hours um, than it is professional dress. Um, I think my worst nightmare is for candidates to come to campus and to, to say, well, this wasn't anything like the recruitment process, you know, that we would have been in any way inauthentic. So the more that I can get across in our message that shows who, what it would be like for somebody to work here is really important. Hicka? I completely agree. Um, I think that one of the worst fears that I have when I go into those meetings in September is for, um, or normally I do them uh, early November or so, is for uh, somebody that we've hired recently to say, you lied to me that this is an inaccurate representation of the organization, um, I'm unhappy, um, I was deceived. And so I think part of the reason why I have those meetings is so that if there's anything that exists in our, in our policies or in our practices that leads to that, um, that I can correct those things before we go out. Because the last thing I want to do is mislead a candidate. Um, I'm, I'm proud of Miami University. I enjoy working here. There are a lot of people who do, and there's no reason for us to lie. Um, and so mm -hmm. if something that you're saying is, is inaccurately um, represented, then I want to make sure I correct that before we go back out. Oh, perfect. Okay. Well, those, that's all the hands that were raised. So remember, at any time, you can always use the chat function to add something in as well, and we'll pass it along to everyone. Um, on the other side of that, what should not be included in your recruitment message? I know later in the agenda we'll talk about who should be on the team. Um, I think that you, we need to really think about members that we have on their, our team and what their strengths are and, and who possibly maybe doesn't have the, the recruitment piece that needs a little more training. So I think that's one thing in the, in the when you're recruiting in the message is who's sending out that message, what voice is sending it out, what are, how is it being represented, that is one thing that I think should be included in that message. Um, thoughts on what should not be included. Obviously anything that's, that doesn't support your mission and your vision should not be included. If you have ever read the document that, um, that Akuho puts out, 
about best practices when it comes to recruiting and retention of entry level staff, you need to make sure that we're putting out stuff that is um, detailed, that's appropriate, that's well organized, right? You don't want to put out information that has mismatched dates, um, that isn't organized, that candidates aren't able to schedule things easily. We'll give another second or so to see if anybody else has anything to add in that. If not, we'll we'll move on to things to other things. I think it's important to well, look at how much information is included in that message. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of universities like to talk about themselves and want to make sure that they get a lot of information out. Um, but I think a lot of times for candidates that could be information overload. Um, so at least going into the placement exchanges uh, before the campus invite to just give them what's the bare bones necessity that they're going to need to, to have an educated conversation with you. I, do, I agree with that, absolutely. There is too much sometimes, so you have to figure out what is too much. I think we all see that the, the exchanges, those folders, and some of us, myself included, are probably guilty of stuffing those folders. And you see candidates walk up to your table inundated with all of that stuff, right? And how much of that does that really get read? Um, and is it only really read for those that are really interested? So what do they really need in that process in the beginning to have that a first phase? And then, you know, what can you add on later? And honestly, most of those materials are really expensive. So, you know, can financially we afford to give out stuff that maybe just thrown in the recycling bin, and are there ways or different times in the process that we can send that information out um, later? Renee. Well, Renee, we seem to be having some technical difficulties, so if you want to type your response in, go right ahead and we'll share that with the group. And Vicka, you're back on. I think it can be a little bit challenging to uh, know what to include and what not to include. I think that's why I, I sense maybe some silence when you first asked the question, Tina, because mm -hmm. I was sitting here thinking, wow, I don't, I don't know what I wouldn't include. But, you know, then when um, Daniel talks about, uh, you know, over-including over information, I think we have a tendency um, because we, because I'm so afraid that people are going to say I was misled or I didn't know, to just really inundate our candidates with lots and lots and lots of information. And actually, I was editing um, some marketing that we're going to use at our placement exchanges. And um, we literally have everything in, this, in this, this piece. And I'm like, you know, this is not that it's not good information, but I can, I can predict that a candidate is going to get this information in a different way. So our brochure doesn't need to have our full job description in it. It doesn't mm -hmm. need to talk, you know, in its entirety about the residential curriculum. It doesn't need all that information because that information is going to come in at a later point. But I think because of that, that desire to be transparent, mm -hmm. we have a tendency to give candidates all the information at the very beginning so that we can avoid hearing, um, oh, I didn't know. I'm like, yes, you did. It was in the folder. But I mean, <laughs> really, how, 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 does that, you know, how does that hold up a, you know, several months later? Um, so I think, that, I think that was a really good point about over, over uh, in, I'm sorry, giving too much information out. Yeah, I know one thing that I switched to a couple years ago that we've had a lot of success. We probably threw out half of the stuff that we put in the folder and saved it for the on-campus process or sent it to people before they came to on, on campus. And then prior to, sent them a, a variety of web sync, websites and links to information about the campus. We don't know if individuals are real tech savvy, and that's where they're going to go to do most of their research anyway. Um, and the feedback we've gotten from individuals who had that they've really liked that because that's where they were going to go anyway and we sent it directly to them so they had it were able to click through it fast they printed the stuff that they maybe wanted and then left the stuff behind so I would say I have eliminated at least half to three quarters of the stuff that I used to give them in the folders Lori you're up um, I just building off of what um, Vicka and, and Tina that you were saying, I, I wrote down as as people were starting to talk that um, less is more, and and we really need to work with finding that just in time delivery. I, I struggle just like Vicka does, and and I'm sure Amy does, who does most of our recruiting on our campus. Um, our associate director, we want to get as much information out as possible, but we don't want it to be information overload. And how can we best use those those resources? So I appreciate this conversation because it, it, it's spurning all sorts of different ideas 
um, that maybe I won't be able to incorporate into OPE because that's two weeks away, um, but we might be able to, to look at a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. And I think for me too, if I can save $500 on some of the brochures that I'm printing, and that could pay for another posting or to bring somebody else on the recruitment team, then I would, you know, I'd much rather have another person there to help um, work on that. And so moving into recruitment presence, um, what strategies are you using to grow um, your institution's presence during recruitment? Because you know there, there are hundreds um, of institutions out there, and we're all kind of doing the same thing, right? I mentioned the folder, and we all naturally knew what the folder was. Um, so what are you doing um, to make sure your presence is out there? Grant? Hi. Um, we're actually, um, we started a postcard campaign this year, and we were trying to look for a way to reach out to candidates. We have a few different types of positions that are open this year, and we wanted just a general introduction to our, um, to our, you know, our process and our institution. And so we produced a postcard this year, and I'm actually going to post the link um, in the questions box, and I'm not sure if there's a way we can get that out to people, but it's just a Dropbox link uh, to show what we did. Um, but we, uh, it, it is actually really cost effective. We went with a company out of California called um, gotprint.com, and mm -hmm. uh, for a maximum of $50, we produced 500. That's um, awesome. These postcards were glossy, double-sided, color. Uh, they're cheaper if you do less, um, and cheaper if you go with different finishes and stuff like that. But it was a really neat way. Uh, we incorporated a QR code um, on the back to link to our website. So it was a really nice. Um, it was a really nice way for us to sort of just hand these out to candidates as they go to different conferences and uh, as we see people so that they have, you know, sort of a quick overview of what we do in, as an office and then they can go to the, to the website to get more information with their smartphone or whatever and the QR code costs nothing to produce. Mm -hmm. um, it just takes the time to sort of design. So for, for under, you know, 50 bucks usually you can get a really nice product. Um, and there is a quick turnaround time. They usually turn around orders within two or three days. Um, plus shipping time, uh, so it was a really easy thing to do in the fall when we started going to conferences and easy to reorder. They're great to work with. They'll give you design advice if you don't have something in mind. So um, that's something that I can definitely recommend. Mm -hmm. And if those of you attending, you can see we posted that in the chat box. You should be able to see that. Renee, it's your turn. Yeah, for us, we've had some success with bringing undergraduate students with us, especially to OPE. Now, granted, Marquette is very close to Oshkosh, so we're able to do that. But um, we take students who have an interest in going into the field of student affairs who are juniors, um, so they get a chance to kind of see OPE and what it's like. And then they also get to tell the Marquette story, um, what their experience is like. And ultimately, especially in hall director positions, these are the students that they're working with on a day-to-day -day basis. And, um, we found that's been really helpful to give candidates um, a deeper look at what our students are like, what our campus climate is like, and um, just being able to have them there with us at the social and to also get their kind of take and feel um, for candidates that we're looking at um, has been really helpful. I think one other thing that we have done here that's been helpful too is really being intentional about who is, is attending and making sure that, you know, it's a good representation and staff, and there are some new staff, but most importantly that we're bringing current staff members who are professionally visible and involved. Um, I think that, that that helps in terms of, of growing your presence, because um, tend to be easy, a little more easily recognizable, et cetera. So that's something that's helped. I think the other thing, too, in terms of OPE, um, having some continuity with the information that we send out, while there is a similar look and feel that we have to it, but there are certain materials that we do each year, um, and not in a way that I think becomes tried or overdone, but just becomes known for that. And it's amazing what word of mouth can do. Anyone else on that question? Well, we'll move into, do avenues of social media play a role in your recruitment process? Um, this is obviously a topic that many people are talking about. I for sure can will say that it, it does have a role in our recruitment process and, and have had um, some pretty significant success using different modes of social media. But I'm curious to know if anybody else has thoughts on social media. Let's start with maybe the be easier question of that is, if you're using social media in your department, what are you currently using? And you can type that in um, or raise your hand for that. You know, here at SIU, we have 
Um, we have the obvious of, of a Facebook page where the Residence Life has one, as well as our housing department and the university has a variety from other departments. In terms of um, Twitter, we have a Res Life account, and then majority of our staff members have, have an account. We've had real big success with staff signing up and using um, Twitter, et cetera. It, has, it by no means is a requirement. Um, they can use it um, as they would like, but it's been really successful for us. Looks like we have some fingers typing, we can see. So be looking to your chat box to see what individuals um, have to say about what they're using. I'd also be curious to know if anybody is doing anything unique with um, social media. Well, a few things that I would encourage you to think about if you are expanding in the role of social media and how to do it. One thing is, is that message needs to be consistent with the recruitment message that we talked about earlier. Um, that the messages that you send out support your institution, the mission, and the vision. Um, you need to double check with your HR um, on campus to see if they have any rules associated with that. Since social media clearly is something that institutions are using, but the conversation is definitely happening right now. And you need to double check to see if your institution has a social media policy. Some do and some don't. There are some really great um, resources out there. The University of Houston has a great website for their social media practices. Colorado State is another one that has really get great information about it. So if you don't have it um, and are looking to develop it, I'd encourage you to, to do some research. I know here at SAU, we've been ahead of the game a bit in terms of housing and res life and what we've been doing. So the institution is kind of catching up with that process. But it's been interesting to work with them and develop it around what we've been doing. We'll go ahead, since we don't seem to have a lot of takers on, on that question, we'll move into the next one. How do you decide who's a member of the recruitment team? I know here, recruitment's a real, it's a hot topic, right? And who doesn't want to go to Oshkosh, Wisconsin, um, or Phoenix, or Memphis, or any of those other places. Um, so it becomes those, it's real exciting. But how do you make the difficult decision of who gets to go? Is, does anybody employ anything unique or different when you're choosing individuals? Daniel Vindica. For us, it's um, important to find a staff member that's easily going to connect with candidates. Um, somebody who's going to be rememberable uh, when it comes time to do the socials, uh, but also somebody who's going to be uh, where they, uh, the candidate feels like maybe they wouldn't call me as uh, the search chair, so they'd be able to call that community director personally and say, hey, I met you at OP, and I kind of want the inside scoop on this. Uh, at the same time, balancing that with a staff member uh, that'll be able to appropriately speak the university's uh, company line, but at the same time in a, in a language that the candidates would understand and appreciate as authentic. Great, thanks. Pika? I do a call out I do a call out in uh, October um, to, get, to, to begin getting a list of who's interested in going. Um, we make a determination fairly early as to where we'll be going. Mm -hmm. I'm excited around that time that we would not be going to OPE this year, um, just mostly because of the location of ACC being in um, mm -hmm. southwest Ohio. It just made more sense for us to go south versus north um, this year. We're normally at OPE school. Um, and then I invite both our full-time and our graduate level professionals to um, articulate an interest and uh, let it be known that our, our priority is to take full-time staff members while graduate students are um, permitted to, to indicate an interest. Um, once I have sort of who's interested, I look to see who is anticipating um, returning to our department. And we give a preference to those, can those, those current employees that are that are not only full-time, but also planning on returning. Um, and then I make a decision based upon that. That's how we did it this year. So. We are, go ahead. Sorry. Got remuted. There we go. We unfortunately can't take students. Um, I was at another school that we did that, and I thought it was a great way um, to do that. But we just, with the number of people that have that interest in going um, and the 
the unique professional development opportunity that that offers. Um, we just at this time don't don't take students with us, but I think it's a great if you can do it. I think it's a great a great way to introduce candidates to your your student population. Yeah, for sure. If you, if you're able to do it, I agree. I think the other thing that I we've done here it's real simple, similar to what you described, Vicka. I think the other part is when you have that group of of interested individuals who want to do, go, making sure that they're incorporated somehow in various stages of the recruitment process. So maybe they won't be the ones that actually go, but maybe one or two of them serve on the formal search committee for the university. And maybe they're helping, maybe one of them is helping coordinating the on-campus on process or any of those various stages. So for me, that has been a way to help um, each person feel included and give them a job and, and help them understand and that gives me some extra insight into if they're ready to go again that following year, but really, but really making it a, a group process. Um, so we talked a little bit about, I, we've heard it mentioned, um, the, the social. So to socialize or not to socialize, uh, tips for surviving the Kukuho and, and OPE socials. Um, you'll see listed there, that first one, Friday, March 2nd at 7 p.m. in the reunion 202, that's the Kukuho social. They had that for the first time last year, so then we'll be having it again this year. And then beneath that on Saturday the 3rd is the Oshkosh, um, the big one on that Saturday night, and it's at the convention center again. Um, I know that that can be an overwhelming time, um, lots of people in, in a variety of spaces. So how do you navigate that? Grant, your hand is up. Uh, I think the socials are great. We do one uh, for both of our processes when we go to conferences at Miami. So when we're at ACPA or TPE, uh, we do host a social. Um, I, I think they're a great way to sort of see candidates outside of the four walls of the interview room, and I think they're a great way for you know the staff to sort of make their, their way around and talk to different people. Um, I think I would offer some words of caution about mm -hmm. how you utilize the social um, and how you um, – how you judge candidates at the social. Um, there have been times in the past where we've attended a social, and, and, and you know, it's a lot of pressure for the candidates. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, thinking back to when I was, um, you know, a young recruit uh, for the field, that I would be there, and you're there with all of the people that you know are your, are your competition, um, and you're sort of in a room with a school that you're really excited about. Um, and I think that there are different expectations for different socials. Some schools are very formal. Um, others are very laid back. Some involve alcohol. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it's good to be really clear about what you're trying to accomplish with the social. So are you are you using it sort of as a really formal part of your interview process, or is it really just an opportunity for you to get to know the candidates and have a place where they can come and hang out and, and get to know your staff? Um, and I think if your staff is on the same page, because we, we've had times before where our staff has been really intense with the social and, you know, where I don't think candidates were necessarily expecting that. And, you know, so I, I think just being... Um, just being transparent about, you know, what, what you expect that social time to be and being careful about how, um, you know, what sort of judgment you make about candidates in that space because it's, it's not a normal situation. I mean, it's sort mm -hmm. of intimidating and not many other job search processes involve <laughs> you being thrown into, you know, maybe you'll go to dinner, but I think in a big, you know, social late at night, you know, where you're interacting with a bunch of people that you're competing with is, is kind of an odd situation. So that's, that's my word of caution. Yeah, that's really great advice. I think the other... Thing that I would add on to that too in terms of really professional etiquette as well is that we you know we don't hoard can candidates to ourselves I think we get real excited about people right and if you brought a big recruitment team you kind of want to get them in and don't let them leave I think we need to be good stewards of, of the profession and make sure that we pass candidates along to to other groups to talk to um, to make sure that they see the best of all institutions and help make those connections and tell them it's okay to move on and talk to um, other individuals. Laura, you're unmuted. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll say from an employment standpoint and the fact that I am a raging introvert of all of the things that this profession does, the socials, I mean, just right now my hands are sweating <laughs> talking about the social. So um, I, I, I can, I, I've learned to live with them, but I think for, for our institution we really um, look at it very similar to to what Grant and Tina were saying. It's a, it's a way to can continue the conversation, and you find ways to make everybody feel comfortable. Those of you that have been to Oshkosh Placement Exchange and know me, I am not one of the ones that goes that moves around. I find a spot, I get comfortable, and then my group will bring candidates to me. And so, 
um, I think there's ways to make it work so that everybody feels comfortable. And I can only imagine being on the candidate side and mm -hmm. having those anxieties that I have as an employer that we really try to find ways to make everybody feel um, comfortable. And I think schools do that by and large, um, find ways to make even the most raging introvert feel comfortable in these um, large social settings. I do love that, first of all, you associate raging with introvert. I think that's fantastic, Lori Berry. Um, but Lori really hit on something that's critical. So, so whether you're, you're recruiting in a group of two or recruiting in a group of ten, the concept of having one person or a few people stay in one location and others going out and seeking and finding and bringing back, um, I think that's the best way to navigate those rooms, especially the large ones like at Oshkosh with the convention center. Because if not, you're going to lose people and, and not find people. So you can always have the strategy of at least one person staying put, whether it's by the door. And, and then make it a place that's highly visible. So when you find somebody, you maybe don't, aren't walking them back because if, if you have a limited number. But you're saying, you can find Tina by the yellow couch near the door when you came in. And that may help people find individuals. Let's move on. Um, making connections with candidates. How do you connect with the candidates beyond their profile and resume, right? Because we've all seen that the profiles, and there are many, and written in, in every way, shape, or form, and resumes in more formats than I'd like to even think about it some days. Um, but how are you intentionally connecting with candidates beyond, beyond their profile and resume? Daniel. I think it's really useful to, particularly if you have a candidate um, that ends up on your interview schedule and very early on, um, you know that their profile or their resume doesn't match what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, that interview process is a reshaping and a rebound for the rest of their search process. Sure. Um, I can think of at least a couple of candidates that we had last year um, that clearly we they weren't going to be a good fit for our institution. Um, and they were really struggling, particularly early on in, on Friday. Um, but to help them gain the skills that are going to help them be successful, because uh, the candidates will remember that, and perhaps you can find employers for them based on our connections that they might be successful at. Absolutely. I think that's a great point, that we should be good ambassadors for one another in this field, and really helping those candidates, and especially those that may not be a good fit, that earlier that we can help them with that process. I think that we have a, a responsibility to educate in this process as well. Um, and making those connections early on is really important. Um, we'll go ahead and move on to the next one since I'm paying attention to our, our time too. Um, how do you include applicants not attending an exchange in the recruitment process? I think that's a real critical conversation. Um, I know I often get asked, so when we ours gets posted on the website and then get posted, gets posted nationally, we have, I'd say, gosh, a good 40% as well that apply beyond. Um, I find it important to let all of those, in the, when we send out the affirmative action pieces, also letting them know that we are um, attending other exchanges so that they're aware that that is happening. But I think it's also critical for them to understand that they're getting a full they'll be fully considered for the position as well. So for me, those individuals that sit on the search committee um, for the formal position aren't ones that are going to the recruitment events so that um, they really do have fresh eyes when it comes to looking at all the resumes for the first time and they see the information. Um, Vicka? Um, what we do is actually every candidate that is interview or interest in a position at Miami has to go through our HR website first mm -hmm. and then um, if candidates include that their you know their OPE number or their ACPA number or their TPE number um, we know that that they're going to be in that poll but if they're not included in that poll and our candidate we're interested in reaching out to um, we email I email them and ask them um, to confirm that they're not going to be at those other placements and then place them in our HR poll we have a team of people back on our campus to interview those candidates using the same exact procedures that we would use at placement. So they get all of the same questions, the mm -hmm. interviews are at the same length of time, um, and, it's, and it's still the same number of people. So um, there are interview teams here that exist in teams of two, similar to what we would see at our placement, who interview our HR candidates. And then um, we, when we start bringing people to campus, we start bringing them 
um, based upon their overall performance, not based upon what particular pool they happen to be in, um, which is really kind of difficult because you leave, uh, last year we left OPE very excited about folks, um, but we needed to wait until, you know, we had had an opportunity to go to TPE and, and get, a, get us into those candidates, and we needed to wait for the HR process to, um, for lack of another word, catch up, because that process mm -hmm. tends to be the one that gets a little bit less attention because it doesn't have a looming deadline like the mm -hmm. other two processes. But um, we, we really strive to incorporate all of our candidates equally. I think that placement is a privilege, um, and a lot of people can't afford um, to, to do that. And so we don't want to disadvantage. Most certainly we don't want to disadvantage our, 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 our candidates, but we also don't want to disadvantage our student or students or our campus because we were uh, negligent in looking at all candidates equally. Great advice, Vika. Um, moving on to the next one, what policies or, or benefits does your institution have that appeal to candidates? I know we're all in the process at times we want to set ourselves apart, but um, it's, it can be a bit of personal shopping for candidates, especially at the entry level position because there are, there are many, as you know. So what are the benefits that that you have found really highlighting for your institution really appeal to candidates. I know one here at SIU in particular is um, the domestic partner policy. Um, we've had one, actually real and extensive one, for several years. Um, so I know that, that is, that's an important part to talk about individuals um, of knowing that they can bring a partner with them to come here and that they will get, they can have receive benefits as well. Um, and we'll get a meal plan and we'll get a parking space and those pieces so we make sure that we highlight highlight that. I know we don't have one, but often the question is, is the pet policy? Like, you know, some of you have been to OP, you will see that some really lead with that in their recruitment efforts of, you know, who doesn't love a picture of a real cute puppy <laughs> um, posted on the wall? Um, but that's one that we get often asked for. I think making sure that people understand some of the things that are in your um, apartments, possibly, you know, one to two bedrooms, you have washers and dryers, is furniture included or not included, um, meal plan, who gets it, how much do they have, do they have access to a degree program or not. Uh, Danny, looks like you've got something to share. Yeah, I would say that um, it's so personal for each candidate. Um, the, we, for our second interviews, we actually don't ask any questions. Um, it's a oh, time. You're one of them. <laughs> What's that? Oh, that's well, that's intense. <laughs> yeah, we we get sent them a note ahead of time to warn them that this is going to be their interview for us, and uh, if they choose to accept the second interview, the expectations that um, oftentimes we send some follow-up materials to them uh, because we send so little at the for the first interview. If mm -hmm on something that we think we've got the materials that they may be interested in a little bit more background. Uh, but also it's the time to say, you know, what is it going to take for us to be a good fit? What questions do you have um, that maybe they didn't disclose in a cover letter and didn't disclose in a first interview? But that's where we get to those questions of, do you have a pet policy? Mm -hmm. um, do you have the partnerships? What is, it, uh, what is it that attracts them to us that we can answer right off the gate? That's great. I do like that you prep them for that process, for <laughs> sure. Vicka? I think that one of our, there's two things that make us unique. The first is that um, we have a pretty substantial professional development allocation. We allow um, our, our full-time staff to have a $1,200 yearly allocation for professional development. Um, and then the other thing that I think makes us unique is that our contract is 43 weeks. And so if someone wants to do an internship or get a different job during the summer or whatever, they have that flexibility in their contract. And those are two things that we make sure we articulate. Very cool. Well, moving down to our final section, since we're getting um, to the end of time, boundaries and guidelines for the recruitment process. How do you navigate the second choice candidate while waiting for the first choice candidate to respond to your offer? I know that that's a dilemma that all of us get into. You've been there, you've had everybody on campus, and you've got the offer out, and you love your two just and would be equally as happy with number two, but you're waiting for number one to respond. What have you, what strategies or advice does anyone have in terms of navigating that very delicate process? Lori Berry. 
Um, it, it goes back to that philosophy of it being a conversation. I mean, we're very upfront um, with our candidates, and we also know that sometimes USI isn't that destination place, so sometimes we're the second choice and not the first choice um, for some of the candidates. And so we just try to keep it open and, and let them know. At any point, they can contact us. We'll tell us where they are in the process. We may not say, you know, we're waiting for our first choice, but we'll say, you know, we're, we're going through our process, and we don't leave, I don't like to leave people on. Mm -hmm. um, I, but, I, but I'm also cognizant that they're going through a job process too. And sometimes we don't get either candidate, but then we'll run across those folks because they're in the field and they're great people anyway. If it didn't happen at USI, then it probably wasn't meant to happen. And just being open and honest has worked well for, for us. Yeah, thanks, Lori. I know one thing that we have done too here, um, because it, if they usually for me, if they've come to campus, unless something really glaring happens, they're probably somebody that you would you're really seriously considering hiring. I know one thing that I have done um, when that offer has gone out to that first one. I'm really firm with when they have to tell me an answer by. Um, I I don't want to be taken advantage of in terms of letting that go because I also know too that I may, as Lori said, not be the their first choice. But I don't want to get into a situation where I'm waiting two or three weeks while they're finishing up their process. Um, so that, and then lose, you know, my second, third, and fourth choice, who may be really fantastic too. So one thing that I, that's something that I have done to um, initiate closure in that process is have set a real firm deadline of when, when the offer goes out, when I have to be told. We'll go ahead and move on to the next one. What changes have you made to adjust to the financial constraints of the recruitment process? And have state institutions that have really felt an impact of this over the years, and we all have in terms of higher ed. Um, so have you made any changes to your process? I know I had mentioned earlier the part about um, really eliminating some of the things that we send out, A, for um, the, the financial burden of what some of those, the really slick and shiny um, information we send out, as I call it, um, reduced it some. But what are some other things that individuals have done? Vicka? Uh, we take leaner teams um, than we used to take. I, I, I think part of it was me being new to the position a few years ago. I just didn't really want to tell anyone no. Um, <laughs> but I'm, I'm much better at that now, so our teams are a lot smaller this year. And then I, the other thing that we do is, um, you know, we look at sort of how far people need to travel. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, not, not that we discriminate, but I think that it impacts how many people we can bring to campus because we are an institution that fully pays for people to come regardless of the outcome. And so certainly somebody coming from Cincinnati is going to be a lot easier to bring than somebody coming from, um, I don't know, Washington State. So um, I think that that's something that we, we look at doing. Um, and then the, I think the biggest, the, the biggest thing for this year was not going to OPE. I think that we have an, uh, an, uh, an affection for OPE. We, I, I personally, as a recruiter, enjoy that space a bit more. Um, then, then I do the larger pla the other placement exchanges, but I think that we had to make a financial decision. We had to look at um, the history of the candidates we pulled from that pool and um, decide whether or not it was a good institutional decision to, to go this year. Yeah, and I don't know if others have noticed it this year, but I know I've definitely noticed in terms of the quantity of the entry level professional seems to be lower this year at OPE than it has, and I don't know if that's because there's a you know, ACE is a little closer and a little more in the center. Um, for sure, but I think that's great advice in terms of what you mentioned for the financial constraints too. We, that is part of the conversation at times. We too are one who will pay for everything, and while it's not part of the conversation up until that top, whatever the number is, so maybe it's top five, but maybe, you know, if you're both on the same and one is um, coming from Seattle and one is coming from St. Louis, well, you may be number five and we're going to bring the other one that's number four that's a little closer. Other. Lori, what have you done to save a little money? Uh, well, we're, we're one of those institutions where we have to make the decision every year. We can go to one place, and where is that one place going to be? And if we don't have any positions open, we can't. So there's been some years where we didn't go to OPE because we didn't have any positions to offer. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a challenge for us because it, not being a destination um, place necessarily for folks, that, that it's, we have to continually find ways to get our, um, our, our word out. The other thing that that um, we're starting to consider even more for, particularly for the GAs that, that we're bringing in, because institutionally they're seen as student workers. Well, of course, for our, our, our departments, they aren't. Mm -hmm. um, they're, uh, 
and we can only re, we can only reimburse to a certain uh, a certain way or a certain amount. And so I'm sure that we'll be using other technologies like Skype and some of those other things that if the candidate's comfortable and we can't pay for them to come in, that they get all the information that they that they need. Yeah, we used Skype a bit during our grad process last year um, to kind of start to see what that was like. Um, and I think the other thing that we will do too in terms of we're watching the numbers that we send um, and whether we can have socials or those sorts of things um, have monitored that, but trying to make some more intentional connections just between providing the list of who we're interviewing and having staff reach out and make some connections via, via email, right? Just tell them what it's like here that they may not be there to have the conversations in person, um, but making sure that they have some connections. So moving on to our last and final question, what are those do's and don'ts of the recruitment process that you would recommend to others? We all, we see then that, that um, whether candidates are doing or our colleagues are, or, um, but what would you, in terms of the do's, what are some things that you just, that are your absolute go-to you have to do for recruitment? Lori Vindica. Um, one of the things that, that we'll do when a candidate is very serious about coming here, and particularly if they're not familiar with the area, is that we make sure that we offer and connect them with someone who has transferred in or, or knows the area so that they can talk about what that transition's, um, transition's like. Um, and I think that's, that's important when you're looking at um, certain candidates that it might be a culture change to come to your institution, whether it's USI or any institution for that matter because the, that transition process is, is important and sometimes can make or break what a candidate thinks about your um, department in this professional choice that they've, they've made. So that's, that's one of the do's that, that we do here. Kate Lurie. I would, I would say that, um, you know, one of the things that we do, and actually I'll give uh, credit to Ball State University, uh, is that we connect our on-campus visitors with a, 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 a first-year advisor. So our full-time first, our full-time staff is a first-year advisor. I mean, that's their title. And then so for candidates for that position, they have a host. Um, and they know about that host when we do the sort of formal communication about when they'll arrive. That host takes them to dinner um, and, and basically makes sure that they're not left alone um, throughout their time here. And I'm not saying that, you know, they're obsessively with them. but. I think that one of the things that candidates talk about is feeling kind of abandoned, and so we strive to make sure that's not a feeling that our candidates have at Miami. Great. I know one thing that's definitely a do is it's really important to me to include and be supportive in whatever way that means for families involved in the process. So um, I, I will make it open for families if they want and partners if they want to come to the on-campus process while they're responsible for the travel part of it. Um, we will absolutely put them, um, give them housing for the evening and, and meals, and we'll include them in portions of the on-campus, like, for example, the, uh, the, the campus tour. Or, and we'll find out if it's somebody, if they, if it's a, a partner coming in and they have a certain interest in terms of a career or a job, what connections can we make for them? Or if they're wanting to go back to school, can we connect them with the academic departments that are here? But, Family is a huge priority, so making sure that, that they know that that's important to us and we value them in this process, too. Moving on to, to the don'ts, any, any recommendations or things that you would say, just do not do this? Renee. Um, mine would include unclear schedules, so for example, mm. um, when like the locations aren't clear where you'll be going, how many people will be in an interview, so what a panel is to so one institution may be different to another, and sometimes we don't know necessarily who all will be included in on an interview at the moment, but any descriptors that can be given as best possible are helpful. And I think little things like including the title um, of that person can be helpful as compared to just their name. Um, so while certainly our candidates have access to Google and everything else to try to seek them out, trying to give them as the most information possible when it's already, I think we can all agree, an under-wrecking mm -hmm. experience going through the interview process. So trying to show that we're setting them up for success to know as much information as possible. Um, I think it's helpful, too, to be able to give, if you can, a draft of what they're going to experience at least a few days in advance when you confirm the on-campus um, to help them to prepare. So 
you know, some are, are better than others in regards to being able to do and provide that, but we found that to be helpful. Um, I'd echo the, the hosting portion and just ensuring that they have a number to call if there is a question that's on their mind. And working in residence life and housing, there's certainly no shortage of <laughs> staff who are available to be able to um, assist if candidates have questions or have something that they need. So um, I'd say in terms of a don't, is it's just providing ambiguous information mm -hmm. or information that isn't clear when we are able to provide it. Right, absolutely. Right, absolutely. I think I think that's really valuable information. You know, you you don't want to have the the staff included that aren't excited about the process, and or maybe, um, you know, if, if somebody who's been on the team and wanting to be there, but that week they're just really having a, a bad week, it's okay for them to sit out of that interview process. You don't want to have candidates walk into offices that aren't, um, you know, kept up and tidy in that, you know, staff don't know that they're coming and don't welcome them and those pieces. I think it's really important to make sure the campus environment is as comfortable as possible and providing candidates as much context as you can. Well, with that, and since it's just a bit after one, we'll go ahead and wrap up the process. I want to thank you all for taking the time to join this Corpulo webinar sponsored by the Programming and Development Committee. Thank you for sharing your information. It was very helpful. I know for me, I wrote down a few things, but I don't need to be doing that. Um, so hopefully this roundtable um, was helpful. But most importantly, we encourage you to keep checking back to the Gukuho website. Um, as Brian mentioned earlier, monthly there will be um, other topics and webinars that are hosted for round, mid-level roundtables throughout the year. So thank you so very much. And with that, we're signing off.